a former pastor and um, commentator over in England by the name of John Stott wrote a book on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and he titled it, great title, it's called Christian Counterculture. It's a reminder that what Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount goes against the current of the world in which we live. And that gap between Christian living and our society, of course, is widening. And therefore, what we're being taught here is essential and very, very important for where we're going. Last week, uh, Rick showed us some introductory stuff, and he reminded us that we have to be very careful with the Sermon on the Mount because it's ten our tendency is to, to see it in terms of its parts and not see it in terms of the whole. Now, we need, we're going to do both. We're going to remind you again and again and again that this is all one sermon. And Jesus, as the uh, masterful, brilliant man that he was, was not just giving kind of little proverbs. He was, he was making an argument. He was describing a life. And that's especially true when we look at the Beatitudes here. Um, these, these all go together. They are not individual proverb-like things. And that's the way we often read the Beatitudes. We say, well, okay, blessed are the, the poor in spirit. Okay, that's good. Blessed are those who mourn. That's good. Uh, blessed are those who are the meek. Oh, good, good. Blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we, and we separate all these. But really, they're, they're all weaving together. They're not describing different kinds of people. It's describing what Christians are supposed to be like. The first four Beatitudes actually tells us how we become children of God. And then the last four or five, depending on how you count them, tell you the impact, what happens to us when we become children of God. It's an amazing sermon. The Beatitudes, uh, I'll be honest with you, they've just come alive to me, this uh, last time we've been studying them because I've seen them with a whole new enthusiasm. So we're, we're going to look at these today, and let me remind you that we looked at um, last week, uh, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And Rick showed you that, that even though God appreciates the poor people, even though there is a blessing to a poor person who puts their dependence upon the Lord to provide for their needs. You know, those people are blessed. That really isn't what Jesus is talking about here. It's the poor in spirit. And Rick showed you that what that means is that the first step for us to be close to God, the first step for us to come into a relationship with him is to realize that we are a mess. We're a mess. We're all a wreck, and we are lost people. We have an impoverished uh, spirit. We are people who are in desperate need of being rescued. And so the first step here is to recognize that we have a problem, and that's what Rick showed you last week, that we cannot save ourselves no matter how hard we try. We just can't do it because we are in deep weeds. Now, the second one here, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is a passage is a great comfort to a lot of people when they're going through a time of grief and, um, and stuff, and we say, oh, God blesses those who mourn, and he does. God blesses people who mourn. In the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, Solomon even says, you know, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a we uh, party because at a party you're just having a good time. At a funeral, you are forcing yourself to think about ultimate issues and that's going to change your life. So mourning has a certain blessedness to it, but that's really not what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who recognize they're a mess, and then those who are broken by it who mourn over their state, who repent of their horrible condition, who say, oh, I am, a, I am a sinner, I am a rebel, I am lost, and I don't know what to do. So that's the kind of mourning that we're talking about here. Um, it, it's repentance. And what repentance is, is seeing our situation and wanting to turn from it. To confess our sin is to... Uh, see our sin the same way God does. Okay, that's what confess means. 
It's not a matter of just saying, oh, sorry. Uh, that, that's really not what confession is. Confession is seeing the horror of our sinful behavior. And there are actually three things, three areas where we're going to mourn. We will mourn, first of all, for the sins that we commit. The, the bad things we do, and we say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, I can't believe I did that. I'm sorry I said that about that person. I'm sorry that I did those things. And, and so we, we want to repent in those situations. And repentance, let me give you an illustration. Let's suppose some young person was outside playing baseball. And they could hit the ball really, really well, or, or not so well, depending on the situation. And they hit the ball right through your window. Now, the person that's typical of today would come up to the, the door of your house and say, oh, I'm sorry, I, can I have my ball back? You know, <laughs> that's really what they're concerned about. They're concerned about getting their ball back. But they say, you know, sorry. The person who repents... It's like the, the kid who comes to your door and says, I am so sorry about breaking your window. Can I take your broken window and get it fixed? And so they take your broken window. They take it to the glass place. It gets fixed. They come back. They actually put the window back in there, and then they wash all your windows. That's repentance. That shows a true mourning. That th shows a true sorrow for what you have done. I mean, you get that, don't you? Okay, that person really is sorry. And that's what this mourning is, that we, we mourn to the point where we are sorry for these things. But there's a second dimension. Not only do we mourn over the sins that we commit, we mourn over the sin that's in our nature. And, and we look at our hearts and we say, you know, even when I'm doing good things, I'm not even doing them for the right reasons. The right reason is to glorify God. The wrong reason is to get people to think you're good or to get God off your back or to retain something for yourself. And, and most of us, and I include myself here, find that my, my heart is just stained. Have you ever had that experience where you're just sitting there and all of a sudden thoughts pop into your mind that are, that are evil and you think, where does that come from? You know, you're driving down the road, you see somebody walking alongside the road, and you say, you know, I, I could probably run them over and get away with it. So be careful if you're walking on the side of the road and you see me coming. Um, <laughs> so far, I've been able to resist that temptation, but you never know, you know. But, but, you know, things like that pop in your head. You think, where does that come from? It's that sin that is part of who we are, and it causes us to mourn. You know, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to rescue me from this? That's the kind of mourning that we're talking about here, that we see that sin is not just the bad things that we do. It is who we are deep down. The third thing is that we see the effect of sin in the world around us. And we recognize the destructive nature of the sin that is affecting our society. And we mourn over that as we look out and we see some of the things that are happening on the landscape of, of the world. And we say, oh, God, how we need something from you. I made a list of some of the things we should probably be mourning about. Human trafficking. People being sold um, to do horrible things. The senseless murders that are anchored simply in hate the murders that have taken place in uh, North Carolina and, and, and all around the world, terrorist attacks, abortion that is being used as a means of avoiding the consequences of the free choices that people make, the attempts to redefine marriage, politicians who are corrupt or seem to act like they are exempt from the law. That should cause us to mourn. The seductive nature of false religions, the persecution of believers and the attempts to silence God's people, pornography and the objectification of men and women, and the rampant idolatry in our society, sports, hobbies, work, money, pleasure. Even in the church, we worship that which is new and innovative instead of the Lord. In other words, we're supposed to mourn over sin everywhere we see it, and we understand how desperately enslaved we are 
and we mourn and we say, oh God, we cannot survive unless we find some help. And the comfort we find is that when we mourn like that, when we look for a Savior, we see that there is one. And that's comforting. Listen to these words from Tim Keller. He writes, to mourn means to go beyond the first beatitude and say, I have problems, but I see now that my problems are not just philosophical. They're not just sociological. They're not just psychological. They are spiritual in nature. My problem is sin. Until you're willing to call your neuroses or your lack of self-esteem or your bitterness or your resentment or your sensitivity, until you're willing to call your problems or to see at the bottom what they are as is sin, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The point is, until we see that we're a mess and until we see that there is nothing we can do about it, we cannot see the kingdom of God because we're trying to build a kingdom of our own. The third beatitude. God, bless those, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the entire earth. Now, you know that the, the older translations, the one that most of us are familiar with, is blessed are the meek. And the problem, I think the reason they've changed that in this modern translation is because meek has this connotation of being kind of a, a wimpy kind of person. And humble really is a better um, concept. And here's the idea that we are people who, um, who understand the depth of our need. And so we come to God not with arrogance, not demanding. We come humbly with our hands and our hearts open to him. Again, let me quote Keller. He writes, when we say blessed are the meek, it means we turn to God humbly and say, I take my hands off my life. There's a surrender here. I don't just admit I'm a sinner. I also turn to you and I surrender to you and say, Lord, you have to take over. There's a surrender that has to happen. So this is important. So he's saying that that humility is not merely just putting yourself down. And you, and you see this all the time with people that they talk about, oh, I'm, I'm really nothing, I'm just a worm. But what they really want you to do is say, oh, no, you're not. See, that's not humility. That's just pride dressed up like humility. Or a, a uh, you know, Academy Award-winning actress who says, well, you know, I'm, I'm really not that good of an actress. Why do they say that? Because they want everybody to get around them and say, oh, yes, you are. You're a fantastic actress. That's pride. That's not humility. We do that all the time. We, we put ourselves down in the hopes that everybody's going to tell us that we are desperately wrong. True humility is when we come to God and we say the truth about ourselves. We say, Lord, I, I, I come to you and I've got nothing. Nothing. I am, I'm a mess. All I've got is broken pieces and I don't even know what to do with them. And Lord, and, and unless you help me, I am desperately lost. That's where that humility comes in. So we, we see our brokenness, we mourn over it, and then we bring it to God humbly, not demanding, but we come to him knowing that we are desperate for his help in our lives. Isn't it interesting, though, he tells us that, that we inherit the earth. And, and it sure doesn't seem that way, does it? In, in the world in which we live, it sure seems like we're losing the earth. But over in Romans, we're told that when we come to Christ, we become joint heirs with Christ. We are part of the will, the inheritance that Jesus is going to get for being the faithful Savior. And so I don't think the world that he's talking about here is, is our physical existence here. He's talking about a future day, the new heaven, the new earth. We're going to inherit something that lasts. We're going to inherit something that's beautiful. And, and somehow in that new heaven and new earth, we're going to have the opportunity to inherit that. We're going to be given eternal life, if you will. If we come to God broken, mourning, and humbly, Christ will Give us the life that we so desperately need. And then there's uh, the fourth beatitude. 
God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Now, now if you're following along your Bible, there's a, there's a star next to justice. And if you look at the bottom of the page, it says for righteousness. And that's really a much better translation. Justice is a part of righteousness, but justice is only one part of righteousness. The word is really righteousness, which means right standing with God, a right relationship with God, doing the things that God desires. And so here's the idea, that, that we recognize our brokenness, we mourn over it, we come to him humbly, and we reach out eagerly for the righteousness the right standing with God that is provided for us through Jesus. And we say, I'm going to run to that. I'm going to run to this righteousness because that's all I have. That's, the, that's what I really want in my life. Now, when we do that, it's going to change us because the gospel is not merely about taking away our pain. It, it, it's about changing us. It's about transformation. And let me illustrate what this, how this righteousness works. Let's suppose you have this chance meeting. Um, okay, you're a guy, you have a chance meeting with a woman. And, and you kind of like her, you know? Well, she's nice. And you go your separate way thinking you'll never see each other again. But then you see each other again. So you say, well, I just, you know, let's spend some time together. And you say, yeah, you know, I'm starting to like this woman. Huh. So now you start looking for another opportunity to get together, don't you? And you have that opportunity and you start really, really liking this person. Now you're going out of your way to find this person. And you know what else starts to happen? Because you're, you're starting to love this person, you start trying to love the things that they love. You start eating maybe things that you never ate before because they like it. Or you start going places where you never went before because... That's where they want to go. You start doing all kinds of other things in your life. You start changing because you want to share in their life. That's what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we come to Christ and we, we take this righteousness that he has given to us, this right standing with God that comes to us purely by God's gift and his grace, when we receive that, we change and we say, I have grown in love with my Savior and I want to live life in a way that will bring me with him more and more. And so it starts changing the way we live. Jesus here is not telling us that we should be seeking, hungering and thirsting for happiness. He doesn't even tell us that we should be hungering and thirsting for blessedness. We should be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for a right relationship with God and hungering to live life the way that God wants us to live it, not because we have to, but because we become convinced that he loves us and what he says to us is right and is best for us. The problem with our society is that you, you, we go to a doctor and, and we want the doctor to take away our pain. Deal with our symptoms, Doc. Make me not hurt anymore. So we want to feel better. We don't want to be better. There's a difference. And we tend to relate to God that way. God, take away, take away hell. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, please get me into heaven. And we want him to take away the symptom. We don't want him to cure the problem, which is our heart. And so what thirsting and hungering for righteousness is about is that God wants to make us not just comfortable. He wants to make us well. And so he changes us. Hungering and thirsting. You know, the, the great thing about hunger and thirst is that it is, it is not satisfied until it's met. You know, the, the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness is one who is just, mm, they just can't, they, they can't satisfy for anything else. They're, they're not happy with just going to church. They're not happy with any of that stuff. For example, 
If you're really hungry for food, is it going to do you any good to have people talk to you about what they're having for lunch? Oh, we're going to have this and that. Okay, that's not helping. Or to show you pictures of food. I know you're hungry. Look at these good pictures. That's not going to help you. It's not even going to help you to go stand outside a restaurant and smell the food. <laughs> that doesn't help. The only thing that will help your hunger is what? To eat. Some of you are, look surprised. No, that, that's really true. You, you should know that from your own experience. That's the only thing that can satisfy your hunger is to eat. Same thing. When we are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the only thing that will satisfy that hunger and thirst is to receive the righteousness of Christ, to, to be made whole, to be, to be saved, we would say, to be transformed by the grace of God and to be transformed in the way that we live our life. So, it says that the person who hungers and thirsts for justice or righteousness will be satisfied. And you know why? Because we spend our life running after all kinds of stuff. You know, we're, we're going we're to chase our kids. We're going to be more active. We're going we're gonna to make more money. We're going to achieve more status. We're going to do all that stuff. And when we do, then we'll be satisfied. But it doesn't work, does it? doesn't work. We're not satisfied. But when we connect to the Lord of the universe, when we find that grace that is given to us, even though we don't deserve it because we are sinful, lost people who are desperate without him, and we come to him humbly, and then we receive his blessing and his salvation, we are satisfied because we find out that we have found what we were looking for all along. That it, it, it wasn't in stuff. It wasn't in the things that the world has to offer. What we were looking for, and we didn't even know it, was God. We were looking for Him to, to fill that gap in our heart and our life. And so, when we mourn, when we hunger, when we come to Him humbly, we we are coming to the Lord and we're saying, Lord, I, I, I'm a mess. Could you fix me, please? And God says, of course I can. I created you. I can not only fix you, I can make you new. And when he does, we go, ah, oh, that's what I've been looking for. I've been reading this year a uh, devotional from Philip Yancey. It's just quotes that Yancey has written over the years. And he tells a time back in 1991 when he was preparing a, a Sunday school lesson about the Beatitudes. And CNN was on in the background. And if you remember, 1991 was at the time of Desert Storm. And um, so Yancey said he stopped because... General Norman Schwarzkopf came on the screen. And this is what he said. Schwarzkopf talked about the success of the military in rescuing Kuwait quickly with precision bombs and great soldiering. When the news report finished, Yancey reflected and he said this. This is what Schwarzkopf was saying. This is what our world is saying. Blessed are the strong was the general's message. Blessed are the triumphant. Blessed are the armies wealthy enough to possess smart bombs and patriot missiles. Blessed are the liberators, the conquering soldiers. Then he says, the bizarre juxtaposition of the two speeches gave me a feeling for the shock waves of the Sermon on the Mount that they must have caused among its original audience. Jews in first century Palestine, instead of General Schwarzkopf, they had Jesus. And to a downtrodden people yearning for emancipation from Roman rule, Jesus gave startling and unwelcome advice. If an enemy soldier slaps you, turn the other cheek. Rejoice in persecution. Be grateful for your poverty. A man who is meek is always satisfied. The point that Yancey noticed was that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, is really about a Christian counterculture. It's about living life differently. It's about thinking differently. It's about moving in a whole different direction. 
And I hope that, that you can put this all together because what we've seen in the four Beatitudes is the way of salvation. We see this vastly different system from the world around us. Jesus reminds us of where our hope is found. He spoke to people and he says, blessed are the, the poor in spirit. Please recognize that just because you're hurting, just because you're lost, just because you are broken doesn't mean that you're discarded. Because really the first step is to realize that you have a problem, and that problem is deep. Blessed are those who mourn, who are sorry for the situation they see in their hearts and lives and come to God pleading for mercy because they know they've got nothing else to offer him. Blessed are those who are humble, who come to God with their hands open and say, Lord, I'm a mess and there's nothing I can do about it and all I can do is come to you and hope that you can save me. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because when God offers us a new standing with him through Jesus, they, they grab it and they, they hold on to it with everything that they have and they allow it to transform their heart and their life. When we do these things, we gain the kingdom of heaven. And, and do you understand that, that all of these blessings, the kingdom of heaven is theirs, they're comforted, they will inherit the whole earth, they will be satisfied. These aren't all separate blessings. These are all blessings that describe what happens to somebody who comes to Christ. We find a comfort that will take us through any difficulty. We are given a, a, a title and a deed to a spot in God's future kingdom. And we find something wonderfully surprising that all the things we were looking for by running away from the Lord are actually found only in Him. It is our hope and our prayer that you already get it, that you understand these Beatitudes because you have experienced these things in your own life. But if you haven't, we encourage you to turn to Him today. No matter how broken you are, no matter how far gone you think you are, no matter how good you think you are, please take a good look at yourself and understand that there is nothing good in any of us. And all we can do is come to him to help us because we can try, we can, we can run faster, but we're like people in quicksand. All it's doing is dragging us deeper and deeper. We need someone to rescue us from outside of ourselves, and that someone is Jesus. If you will do that, if you will come to him and you will come with open hands and a humble heart, if you will come hungering and thirsting for what Jesus can only give you, you will find that you will begin a wonderful journey of walking with him in a way that is good and true and pleasing to God. And it will be wonderfully satisfying to you. And then you will understand that's what it means to be blessed. Let's pray together. Father, the richness of your word astounds us. The reality of our lostness troubles us until we bring it to you. How amazing this thing is that we call the gospel. That you take broken people and you put us back together again. Not in the way that we used to be, but you make us into something new. You make us into something different. You you change our hearts. You change our status with you. You bring us into a relationship with you, and that just staggers us every time we think about it. Help us, Lord, to think about it more often so that we will worship, that we will give thanks, and that we will walk with you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.